Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that teaches you how to advance into retirement rather than retreating. I'm your host and valedictorian, Eric Brotman, and do you believe it? We're in the season finale of our fourth season of the show. This has been so much fun, and today's guest, I think, is going to be one of the highlights of the season and maybe of the podcast in general. Dr. Daniel Crosby is with us today. He's a psychologist, a behavioral finance expert who helps organizations understand the intersection of mind and markets. Dr. Crosby's first book, Personal Benchmark, Integrating Behavioral Finance and Investment Management, was a New York Times bestseller. And his second book, The Laws of Wealth, was named to the Best Investment Book of 2017 by the Axiom Business Book Awards and has been translated into seven languages. His latest work, The Behavioral Investor, is a comprehensive look at the neurology, physiology, and psychology of sound financial decision-making. Daniel's also a, a terrific guy, and I'm so glad to have him on the show. Welcome, Daniel. Glad to have you. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here with you, brother. You know, when we met, it's been north of a decade since we met, and I, I absolutely was drawn to your work immediately because I tend to believe that financial advisors uh, are, we're certainly not therapists, we're not trained for it, but so much of what we need to do with our clients is as psychological as it is financial that I was really drawn to this field of study that I didn't know existed. And now that I've read more about it, uh, I still consider you the preeminent expert on that. How did you get excited about, uh, about this field? And, and can you tell us in a granular way sort of what this field is, where it came from and what it is? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my, my journey actually looks a little bit like yours. I am the, the son of a financial advisor. And so I was midway through a PhD in clinical psychology, which is indeed what my, my doctoral degree is in. And I was about three years into a five-year program and I was just burning out. You know, I was I was meeting with 40 or 50 clients a week, all of whom were having the, you know, the worst week of their lives. And while it's important, meaningful work and it's it's work that I still believe in, it was taking a, a huge personal toll on me. And so I came to my financial advisor, dad, and I'm, you know, whatever, all of 24 years old at the time. And I said, hey, dad, you know, I, I love psychology. I love thinking deeply about why people do the things that they do, but I don't think this work as a, as a clinician is for me. And my dad, who, you know, was an advisor in North Alabama, he had never heard a thing about behavioral finance, said, look, son, there's a lot of psychology in the work that I do. And he's like, why don't you see if there's anything to do in the in the field of finance with psychology? And at the time, Eric, I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, <laughs> I really I really thought of my dad as a numbers guy. He's this smart, uh, analytical guy who um, you know sells sells product and uh, and uh, analyzes which stocks to buy. I didn't think there was a bit of psychology in the work that he did. But, but his question led me down a path of, of discovering behavioral finance, which to answer your second question, is just finance that accounts for the messiness of human behavior. We know that people are uniquely stupid about money. You know, in, in, in my most recent book, I actually looked at the research into electric stimulation of the brain. Like if you look at, at how the, the brain lights up when we think about different things that have some excitatory power, things like family, things like sex, things like drugs, like all things like death, these, these things that, that have some emotional valence to them. The thing that has the most emotional valence of all, it's not death, it's not you know childhood trauma, it's money. And so we get so sideways with money and it's so big a part of our psychological lives that financial advisors have this unique role in, in helping people straighten out their money stories and in, in a real way, straighten out their lives. I'm glad that you were able to distill that and also bring some psychology. And I actually studied English and psychology in school um, and loved it, absolutely loved it and, and loved to communicate and to write and to think and to understand why people make certain decisions. And like most English majors, I've been a financial advisor now for 28 years. <laughs> um, and, and so it was a confluence that came to me rather quickly, which was people aren't making decisions based on what's logical or rational. They're making it based on a bunch of biases. And I, and I think the textbooks that I've read on this subject now 
identify 20 or 25 biases that are inherent in all of us and things that we do. And I'm sure you could talk to all of them. But what I loved about your book is that it's not a textbook. So as much as I enjoyed the textbooks, um, I think a lot of the general public would be maybe lulled to sleep by the textbook mentality. But yours isn't a textbook. Yours is more of a, it's almost a narrative. And you go through the 10 rules. So, you know, David Letterman made a living doing top 10 lists. This is sort of your 10 rules of behavioral self-management. Can we go through those? Because I think there's so much value in them. And I don't want to spoil the book because I'm hoping our listeners will go out and, and get a copy also. But um, let's just go through a couple and, and see where that takes us. Would that be all right? Yeah, pick a couple of your favorites. Let's go. Okay, so my, my, favorite, my favorite one is number four. If you're excited, it's a bad idea. Now, that is true on so many, so many levels, but, but how do you put that into financial context? Is that, oh my gosh, I got a tip about a hot stock and so now I'm, I'm about to make terrible decisions or whether it's crypto or whatever, like how do you, how do you put that into, into financial terms? Yeah, one of, the, one of the themes of the book I think is that, is that decision-making styles and, and intuitions that serve us well elsewhere tend to serve us poorly in financial markets. So when we look at something like dating, your gut feel about someone you go on a date with is actually quite good because we know that in order for intuition to be effective, a couple of things need to, to be in place. Uh, the first is it has to be something that we do with some regularity. Well. Uh, you meet people all the time, right? Like you meet people every day, however casually, and you get pretty good at sussing out who you want to spend time with and who you don't want to spend time with. Uh, the second piece of information we need is, is we need to get some feedback in a relatively short amount of time, right? So if those conditions are met, your excitement or your lack of excitement about a date is a pretty darn good indicator of whether or not that person should have a second or a third date uh, and and you should listen to your gut that doesn't apply to markets though you think about something like uh you know buying an etf or buying a mutual fund or a stock uh, that's not something that that most of us do with any sort of regularity. So the first condition is violated. And then the second condition is that you need to have immediate feedback. And, you know, uh, you just don't get that in markets. I mean, think about someone who bought Amazon in the, you know, in the late 90s. Well, was that a good decision or not? Well, uh, in the short run, yes, it went up quite a bit. In the medium run, it dropped 90%. Uh, and then in the long run, yes, of course, we all know now that if you've bought and held Amazon for 20 something years, you've done extraordinarily well. But the timelines are so variable, it, it gets hard for us to know whether a given decision was right or wrong, uh, sort of depending on our timeline. So when we look at types of investing that are exciting, it would be things like the meme stock craze of the last couple of years. It would be things like day trading. And yet we see that in the largest study of day traders ever done, only one in 360 day traders uh, were, were successful. Only one in 360 of them uh, showed any real evidence of skill. And we also know from the research that's been done now in, in 19 different countries, that the more you trade, the more you trade your account, the worse you tend to do uh, with the most active investors underperforming the least active investors by uh, about 4% per year. And so all these forms of investing that are exciting uh, ha have been routinely shown to be, uh, to be ineffective. And then the second thing we have to keep in mind is that uh, intuition and emotion are just not good guides to markets uh, the way they are good guides to other pieces of, of our lived experience. There's a saying that we all know and love, which is don't just sit there, do something. And in mm -hmm. the financial world, I think we've got that completely reversed. And I often tell people, don't just do something, sit there. And when you're a financial advisor, and, and particularly when, when markets are difficult, whether it's the, the tech bubble, whether it's the, the financial crisis, uh, or even whether it's the first quarter in, in during COVID, um, when you have these, these moments where you wonder, oh my gosh, is, this, is it different this time? And is this the end of the world? Is the sky falling? And so forth. 
most of the time, it's better to take a step back, take a deep breath and really look at it rather than trusting your gut, as you, as you indicated. But when you're a financial advisor, sometimes clients expect you to have a magic answer or a, or a solution that they should act on immediately. And so if the advice continues to be just stay the course, the advice sounds very boring. And sometimes it can call into question whether you're doing something as a financial advisor. And it, it's, a, it's a neat conundrum. Can you speak a little bit to, to, to the value? And I know you've done the, you've read the alpha studies and the advisor alpha piece. And can you talk a little bit about the value of a financial advisor when it comes to decision making or maybe even not making a decision at that moment? Yeah, so it's, you know, the, the example that you just gave of what psychologists call action bias, you know, we know that when the game is on the line, we, we tend to want to, to do something. And that makes a lot of sense, again, in, in other parts of our lives. You know, if you want to get smarter, you should read more books. If you want to get fitter, you should lift more weight. Uh, but then if you want to get richer, you should do nothing is, you know, is, is everything that the research suggests to us. And so that's where a financial advisor becomes so critical. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a few of the studies, but here's one that I found absolutely fascinating. It's just some, some numbers I ran the other day. If you had invested 50 years ago, okay, so 50 years ago, you invest in a value fund and you invest $10,000 in a value fund. Uh, that ten thousand dollars would would today be worth two point one million dollars. If you would put that same ten thousand dollars in a growth fund, it would be about one and three quarters, like one point seven five million dollars. Either result is absolutely incredible. Uh, but the average investor turned that ten thousand dollars not into two million, not into one point seven million. They turned that into two hundred and eighty five thousand dollars. And the way that they did that was by uh, succumbing to fear and greed and trying to time the market and jumping in and out. And this is where the value of an advisor becomes so enormous. You know, uh, another study that I'll, that I'll talk about, probably my favorite that I cite in chapter two of the Laws of Wealth, is it looked at research out of Canada and the reason why I love this study, it's called the Canadian Value of Advice Report. But the reason that I love it so much is they did a great job with the statistical stuff. They, they controlled for group one versus group two across 50 different socioeconomic variables. And they compared groups of people who did receive financial advice to those who did not, but then of course normalized it across things like salary and socioeconomic strata, because of course it's no fair uh, to compare folks who make a lot of money to folks who make a little money. But they found that, that uh, you know, holding these 50 variables constant, that people who worked with a financial advisor over the long term had 2.7 times the wealth of their peers. These are their socioeconomic peers. These are their earning peers. And these people had uh, nearly three times as much terminal wealth. And the reason is not because financial advisors know the future. It's not because financial advisors have access to some incredible product that, that only they have. It's, it's because at three or four critical junctures in, in March of 2020, when you thought the sky was falling, and let's be honest, had very good reason to think that the sky was falling, like had a had a heck of a, you know, a, a global crisis, a legitimate global crisis. And if you wanted to sell out at that time and your advisor kept you invested, you'll never be able to repay her. You'll never be able to repay your advisor for that advice uh, because the, the value that accrued to you by listening to that advisor is just so enormous. And of course, that value compounds over time. So the rule you're referring to in the book is uh, rule number two, you cannot do this alone. And you know, we spend a fair amount of time figuring out what should you do yourself? And the example you use is essentially, should you be mowing your own lawn? Maybe you love to do that, but in the absence of loving to do that, it may not be the best use of your time if your time can do other things. And that's just one example. But 
there's so many of these types of of gems here, but you also go through an interview. And it's interesting because uh, in Don't Retire, Graduate, we go through questions to ask your financial advisor and you go through a list of them at that same point because having a financial advisor is, it, it may be important, but having a good financial advisor is darn important because like any other profession, there's some really terrific advisors out there and then there's some hacks for lack of a better term. And unfortunately, if you pass an exam, you have a license and that's true whether it's medicine or education or or or, uh, or finance but let's talk about some of these uh, some of these questions the number one question that you asked and i i presume these are in some form of order though i i don't know that that's true the first one is are you a fiduciary the word fiduciary has been tossed around congress like the word infrastructure what does it mean in your opinion to be a fiduciary and and why is that important and is it the only way yeah, so a, a fiduciary in my in my own terms, there may be a legalistic definition that I'm missing here, but in in my way of thinking, it's someone who sits on the same side of the table with you, who benefits when you benefit, and who has uh, a legal obligation to act in your best interest. So, you know, one of my great frustrations is that uh, you know the term financial advisor is not protected in any meaningful sense. Like I, I can call myself a psychologist because I have a PhD in psychology. And if you don't have a PhD in psychology, you are not a psychologist. You cannot like that is a, that is a legally protected term. People have some understanding of what that means. Financial advisor is not that way. And you know, when, when my wife read this book, you know, I said, Hey, you know, what, what stuck out to you? And she said, this list of 10 questions to ask your advisor. And I was like, really? <laughs> like, this is not my, not my favorite part of the book or anything. Mm. And she said, yeah, you know, look, if, if, if you died tomorrow, right, if you died tomorrow and I needed to, you know, find someone to, to help us manage, uh, manage the money I'd been left, she said, look, I'm, I'm not going to remember all the stuff you wrote in this book. There's some complicated stuff in there. I'm not going to remember it and implement it all perfectly, but I want to be able to choose someone thoughtfully who can help me with that. So, so I think, you know, questions like, like yours and like mine are, are important to get that process right, because the value an advisor can provide is immense. Uh, but of course, the damage that can be done by the, by the wrong advisor is, is, equally, is equally dramatic. And let's talk about some of the behavioral risks, because there are many. And um, I, again, I love that you didn't write a textbook, but there's a few that I think resonate, for me anyway, more than some of the others. One of them is this sort of confirmation bias idea. And we live in a world with a 24 seven media cycle where you can pick a channel on television to tell you exactly what you wanna hear. And people do that with the news and with politics and with all kinds of other things. When it comes to finances, in some ways you can do the same thing. You can find some analyst somewhere who thinks the stock you just picked is brilliant and someone else who thinks it's foolish but we tend to pay more information or more attention to the ones that, that back us up. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's, that's a very fair assessment. You know, gone, gone are the days of, of Walter Cronkite being sort of like the, you know, the, the people's news person. We do, we are able to select into any uh, sort of uh, message we want to hear. And there's interesting research to show that we, we spend a lot more time with, unsurprisingly. We spend about 60% more time listening to messages that that congrue to our opinions you know if we if we encounter an article or or a piece on the news that that's inconsistent with our way of thinking it's very very easy to click on to to the next thing uh one of the most dangerous things that we can do i think you know in in the spirit of this question though is to conflate our politics with our investing you know if you look at the last a uh, couple of political cycles. It's no secret that uh, the left and the right are finding less and less common ground. This isn't just sort of some impulse we have. This isn't just sort of our vague notion. The studies show that uh, the, the center is increasingly barren and that the polls to the left and right are getting, are, are getting further and further out there. And so uh, what we're seeing is people's opinions about the economy and the market tend to hinge largely on whoever's in office. So if uh, if 
the person you like, if the party you like is in office, you tend to think the market and the economy are doing well. And the reverse is also true. And this is sort of independent of conditions on the ground. So yes, confirmation bias is super dangerous. We can self-select into any stripe of political or financial reporting that, that appeals to us. And you know, uh, as a follow-on comment, investing alongside your politics is a very, very dangerous and wrong-headed way to invest. It's funny because there's more of that happening now than ever. Whether it's in public mm. plans, whether it's around ESG, whether it's around um, this this idea of used to be called the the sort of the sin taxes were being implemented. This idea that that the that the casino stocks were going to do better than the nutritionist stocks because it's it made people feel good even though it was bad for them. Is that what you mean by allowing your politics to do that, or are you thinking even more deliberately when a politician hawks something or or promotes something? No, no. There's uh, I. That's a, a a great follow on. I'm talking about what I what I have seen is that let's say someone who is a Republican when the Democrats in power might say, you know what, uh, Biden's in power now. Not interested. That you know the other team's going to wreck the economy, and it it absolutely happens on on both sides. You know, I saw plenty of people during uh, the Trump administration say, look, I I don't like this guy. I'm taking my ball and going home, and they missed out on some pretty extraordinary years. And so I think uh, what you're talking about is socially responsible investing, values-based investing. Go ahead if that appeals to you. I do think anytime you limit your investment universe, uh, whether you take away sin stocks or uh, you, you know whatever kind of limitation you're putting, I think there are trade-offs that that happen there, and you have to be realistic about what you're giving up. Uh, but in some ways, that's that's a behavioral good. Um, when people invest alongside their values, you know, you think about um, Catholic, Catholic funds have been around for a very long time. And you, you think about where there's a market disruption, someone who's holding the S&P may have no real attachment to the S&P, and that may be very easy for them to sell and go to cash, whereas someone who's holding you know, the, the Ave Maria Catholic Values Fund may have very different opinions about that and feel more wed to it, feel more tied to it than, than perhaps someone in a more generic fund. So I, I actually think there's some behavioral upside to investing in ways that are consistent with your ethics or your morals. Uh, but I do think there's some profound downside to sitting out periods of time when your non-preferred party is in power, which is something I've seen quite a bit of in the last, call it 12 to 15 years. So Daniel, there are about 25 different types of risks and, and biases and so forth, and they're all detailed in the book, and we certainly don't have time to do them all. Um, but my, my last one that's sort of a, a favorite of mine is the, the idea of loss aversion. The idea that a, a loss of the same size as a gain is more painful than the gain is pleasurable and I, you know, I've seen that in so many different walks of life. And one of the easy ways to see it is, is when you go to a casino for fun and financial advisors using casino references might be, might be uh, foolhardy, but people get it. And that is if you take a hundred dollars to the casino and you win a little bit of money, that's lovely. But if you take it to the casino and you lose it, you feel really unhappy about it. Even if that's what you had taken with the idea that that's what I can play with, that's what I can afford to lose. There's also on top of that, a tendency to say, well, I, I started with $100, now I have 300, so I'm not really playing with my money, I'm playing with their money, and then you give it all back, which is why they have fountains in their lobbies. When in fact, it's your money because you could go cash it and go have a steak. So there's a reason why casinos are winning and, and, uh, and gamblers are losing most of the time. So can you talk about those two phenomena? I know they're not both loss aversion by definition, but I, I think they go hand in hand. Yeah, so we'll talk about uh, loss aversion, and the, the second one is called the house money effect, or, or it's a form of mental accounting. So loss aversion really has evolutionary roots. So, I mean, if you think about many thousands of years ago when, when life was uh, more nasty, brutish, and short than it is today, 
uh, y- there's really an asymmetry between a bad day and a good day. Like, right. If you, if you have a good day, then hooray. If you, if you have a bad day, you die. Right. So we have, uh, we have an asymmetry between how we think about risk and reward. And it's about two and a half times to your point, you know, losing that hundred dollars feels about two and a half, half times worse than, than winning that, that hundred dollars feels good. So that's loss aversion. And it's something we always have to be, uh, on, on the lookout for because the 10% up years in the market are, are sort of easy to forget. And the, the 10% down years hurt quite a lot. And so the, the second related phenomenon that you're talking about is, is what we'll call the house money effect, which is a form of mental accounting. And what mental accounting says is we have these internal buckets or or labels that we that we put on money. Right. So like this is my rent money. This is my electric bill. This is my, you know, go get an ice cream sundae money. We sort of mentally label different pots of money even though money is fungible, right? Like the the money I have earmarked to pay my mortgage can just as easily, you know, buy me new tires or a new ice cream sundae or a hundred other things. And so mental accounting has some upside and some downside, right? Uh, it can make us sort of unnecessarily inflexible around money. It can cause us to to do what you cited in the example and, and put those pretty fountains in front of the Bellagio. But we can also use it to, to great effect if we're intentional about it. You know, one of the ways that people overcome uh, this, this loss aversion that you talked about is by having a safety bucket. So, you know, let's say wh- whatever this looks like for you, let's say it's a year of, of sort of income set aside. So even if the market's choppy, even if things are bad, I know I have this sort of mental account for safety so that I'm not going to eat cat food for a year, even if the market has a rough year. We also know that people can label their monies in ways that leads to better behavior. You know, people who label a, a pot of money with a picture of their children ha- tended to save more than 200% more than people uh, who were using unlabeled accounts. So there are ways in which sort of naming those dollars, as, as Dave Ramsey calls it, naming these dollars can help us make better decisions. Uh, but we have to be careful that it doesn't get used against us uh, if there's, say, a bonus, you know, an unexpected bonus or a tax refund. These get labeled as as fun money in a way that, um, you know, perhaps regular W-2 income does not. And that can be used to our disadvantage. So we have to be thoughtful about our own internal uh, implicit and explicit ways that we're labeling and thinking about our money because that's a really big impact on how that money gets spent or saved or invested. Well, Daniel, as advertised, this has been awesome. And I I could talk to you for three hours. Uh, In fact, I'd like to at some point, maybe not on air, but I have to ask you because, you know, we talk so much about retirement on this show and, and how much it's not always a good idea to retire and be idle and, and needing a purpose. So what do you want to be when you grow up, Daniel? What's the next, what's next for you? So I really, really wanted to be the catcher for the St. Louis Cardinals for a really long time. And that didn't work out. Yadier Molina is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, and he's <laughs> done a much better job than I ever could have. So with that out of the way, I think, Eric, I think my calling is to teach people about meaning. You know, I, I want I'm working on a book right now very slowly. I think it's going to be sort of my my life's work. Uh, a book about helping people find and name their life's purpose and find their life's work. So something I feel strongly about, it's a, it's a journey I'm constantly on and it's a journey I wanna help other people to take. So that's, that's what I wanna be when I grow up, someone who, who talks about the meaning of life and writes about the meaning of life. Fantastic. I will be, uh, I will be an er- getting an early copy of that as soon as I'm aware of it, for sure, um, because I, I thoroughly enjoy your writing. That is something I will want to participate in. If you need a copywriter, I'm not that necessarily, but I'll be glad to give it a read. Love so it. We're, at, we're nearing the end of our show. There's so much wisdom here, and the, the obvious extra credit assignment for every listener right now is to, to go pick up uh, The Laws of Wealth, Psychology and the Secret to Investing Success, or any of Dr. Crosby's books. Daniel's an amazing writer, and this is not a textbook. It's not a boring read. It's a fun, interesting, 
a thoughtful read and and you will i think start to identify some of your own behaviors and potentially find some corrective action whether it's with a financial advisor or not despite the very compelling evidence that having an advisor is, is a good thing but other than that obvious extra credit question is there anything else you would suggest folks do to to sort of get a handle on their own behavior and how it's impacting them financially yeah, I would I would encourage folks to go check out a a mental model called the the PERMA model. So that's P E R M A and it was developed by Dr. Martin Seligman and it's really sort of a checklist for a life well lived. So real quickly, these are the five things. Seligman is a positive psychologist. So instead of studying, you know, what makes people anxious and depressed, like clinical psychologists like me study, he he sort of studies what makes people great leaders or what makes people well. And the five parts of the PERMA model uh, are positive experiences, engagement, relationships, meaning, and advancement. And there's a ton of depth around each of those. But basically, it's are you having fun? Are you doing important work? Are you surrounding yourself with people you care about? Are you working for something bigger than yourself? And are you getting better? Are are you better today than you were yesterday? And if if you're doing these five things, you're going to have a very rich life. And and what we find is that a lot of times when people retire, and this is why I love the name of your podcast, a lot of times there's a real dip in happiness and meaning when people retire because so many of these sort of five buckets are are met nicely in the workplace. You know, you work with nice folks, you're you're getting better, you're learning new things. And when people retire, there can be a if we're not intentional about it, there can be a real dip in happiness. So I'd encourage people to go check out, uh, you know, in addition to my books and, and Eric's book, I would, I would encourage people to read Martin Seligman's work and, uh, and, and get familiar with this PERMA model and pick one of those five pillars where you think you could, could improve a bit. You know, my book has never been mentioned in Better Company, Daniel. Thank you for that. <laughs> Martin Seligman was my professor at Penn when I studied psychology. No way. There. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I, I took an abnormal psychology course with him that we can talk about offline. But of course, like any other psychology student, when you read an abnormal psychology textbook, you you identify that you have every single condition. <laughs> so uh, I diagnosed myself with about 47 different ailments at that point during one semester. But he's an incredible, incredible uh, instructor, an incredible writer. And the PERMA model is awesome. And positive psychology the idea that there is a key to happy uh, does matter, and I, I'm a firm believer. Mm. So great, great suggestion. Amazing extra credit assignment. Folks need to go on and get your book. Uh, certainly Amazon is an answer. Are there other places to get it or any of the major bookstores or, or retailers? Any of the major bookstores work. Amazon, I hate to say it, Amazon's always the easiest. So yeah, just start there. Make, make Bezos <laughs> a little wealthier than he is. Well, you know, he's having behavioral financial issues himself, I'm sure. <laughs> They're different than mine and yours. <laughs> well, this this was fantastic. Thank you for being here. Um, I do hope our listeners will check out uh, Daniel's book. Um, and uh, I thank you all for listening. This has been an amazing journey. Um, and, and to complete four seasons of a podcast is not something that uh, I never really thought that was possible. And yet, we'll be talking about a season five kickoff and doing some really neat things this summer um, when we're not recording the new episodes to bring back some of our, our favorite guests over the years. So I, I hope you'll continue to check us out every Thursday. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. Please subscribe to it. We'll be back with an all new season in the fall. Uh, rate our podcast on Spotify or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. That makes a huge difference. Uh, and to check out our books and workbooks and online financial literacy resources, you can go to BrotmanMedia.com. For now, this is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate, and have a phenomenal summer vacation. From this day forward, let us begin changing the way we view retirement. Today, I implore you, don't retire, graduate. Visit our website at BrotmanMedia.com to subscribe. And please like us and post comments on social media. Securities offered through Kestra Investment Services, LLC. Kestra IS, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Kestra Advisory Services, LLC. Kestra AS, an affiliate of Kestra IS. Kestra IS or Kestra AS are not affiliated with Brotman Financial or any other entity discussed.